So everyone recognize this is what we would call an aldehyde. It's a carbonyl connected to a carbon chain and a hydrogen, not a carboxylic acid. That would be a different type of carbonyl containing compound. So what would this tautomerize into? So basically what's happening is that the alcohol carbon is turning into a carbonyl carbon. And you're losing the alkene. We're losing the alkene and the, and the alkene and the alcohol carbon is turning into a carbonyl carbon. It happens without any reagents, without any, right? Uh, well, it probably helps to have a little acid or base. But yeah, uh, basically we'll, we'll think of this as just happening naturally. This will just happen naturally. Off. Uh, well, what actually is happening is that this H is... Oh, it's a haldide. This H <coughs> is moving over here. We, you don't need to know the mechanism this semester. You'll go over the mechanism next semester. But notice, this is a CH3 and this is a CH2. So this hydrogen is moving over here and the pi bond is moving over here. You'll go through the mechanism for that next semester. All we need to know for this semester is that the enol is unstable and the way it tautomerizes is you get rid of the carbon-carbon pi bond and where the alcohol used to be, you put in the carbonyl. So here we got rid of the carbon-carbon pi bond and where the alcohol used to be, we put in the carbonyl. And depending on what we started with, we could get an aldehyde or a ketone. So far, so good. Yeah. Um, I have a random naming. Okay. But um, I, how would you name that? Okay, that seems like a good question. Why don't we finish with these ideas okay. and then uh, remind me to come back to that? The lesson of what we just said is that if you produce an enol, that's not your final product. If you produce an enol, that's not the final product. You should then tautomerize it to the aldehyde or ketone. So now we need to go through the mechanism for this reaction. I'll give you some hints. This is just a catalyst and we're not going to have to pay attention to it. So we won't pay attention to how this participates in the reaction. And we should be able to pre predict, based on our previous principles, what would happen first here. Yes. That's a good question. I don't see them talking about that in the textbook at all. It seems like that would work. 
but I don't see them showing that in the textbook. So it doesn't look like, that might be a good uh, application question, but that doesn't look like a standard reaction. Let's talk through what we did so far. Now, I was saying that the first step should have been easy. Why is the first step supposed to be easy? Because there's a strong acid. The first step should always be easy when there's a strong acid. If there's a strong acid, you must start by having the strong acid give its proton to somebody. I don't think you guys have seen any exceptions. If you have a strong acid, you must start by having the strong acid protonate somebody. And the only good candidate to be protonated here is the pi bond. We know that pi bonds are good electron donors. So we're going to start by protonating this pi bond. That's an important principle. If you have a strong acid, you start by having the acid protonate somebody. Now, why should we put the positive charge on the left and not on the right? Because again, it's the more substituted carbon. It looks like you guys are getting comfortable with that. So the hydrogen ended up over here. So, so far, this is similar. And now, who's going to be the nucleophile that comes in? Well, one thing is, we also produced sulfate here. But I think we've learned that sulfate is not a nucleophile. We've learned that sulfate is not a nucleophile, so we don't need to worry about the sulfate attacking this carbocation. We just need to memorize that. Instead, the water can come in and attack. Remember, we're not really going to worry about the role that the mercury is playing over here. This playing some unspecified role as a catalyst that we're not going to show in the mechanism. So we need, you do need to show the mercury to show that the reaction would work, but we're not going to include that in the mechanism. Uh, so it looks like I uh, have some stuff out here, right? Because this would at first have a positive charge. And then presumably the sulfate could now deprotonate it. We've seen reactions like that a bunch of times. If your main reaction leaves you with the charge, you can get rid of that by deprotonating if it's a positive charge. Looks like all of you guys might have ended too soon. Because what's the name of this type of functional group when we have an alcohol and an alkene? Oh, exactly. This is an enol, but enols are not stable. Remember the lesson we were talking about a few minutes ago? If your final product is an enol, you messed up. The final product can't be an enol because enols are unstable. They should tautomerize, as we were talking about a couple minutes ago. This is the only part of the, you guys were asking me if there's any reactions that are not just extensions of alkenes. So far, this has just been an extension of the alkene reactions. The only new thing is the tautomerization. That's right. And again, in this semester, we're not going to learn the mechanism for the tautomerization, so we just have to write that. So one thing, I'm going to get rid of the alkene double bond. And remember that the alcohol turns into a carbonyl. And you just have to make sure everyone has enough hydrogens. Make sure everyone has enough hydrogens for this to make sense. So this would turn into a ketone. So yeah, we would not get full credit if we stop with the enol here. So the point here is, and uh, by the way then, somebody was asking whether this could happen twice. Well, maybe it wouldn't happen twice, but because, because, before, the second, because before the second reaction had a chance to happen, maybe the enol would tautomerize into this carbonyl. So maybe that's the reason why the textbook doesn't talk about this reaction happening twice. Maybe this enol doesn't last long enough to get attacked the second time before it turns into the carbonyl. And of course, we have lots of reactions we can do on carbonyls. We can attack them with Grignards. We can reduce them with sodium uh, borohydride. So this gives us another way. This is a new way, then, to make carbonyls. When you add sodium borohydride, do you add, if it just gives you sodium borohydride, you'd add the H to reduce the, the double bond as well as add an H to make an alcohol? Sodium borohydride can be added at the same time as the protonating solvent. OK, but you do need a protonating solvent. Usually an alcohol. Whereas lithium aluminum hydride has to be added in two separate steps. 
you go back to the handout on R minus and H minus, this is kind of laid out. Sodium borohydride is put in at the same time as the, as the protonating solvent. Lithium aluminum hydride green yarns have to be added separately from the protonating solvent. And if you would just add NABH4, it would simply make it O minus? I suppose that's right. You hardly ever see that, but that's right. Without the protonating solvent, you would end up with an O minus. Okay, so the big thing we learned here was this new rea reaction, and again, this was still mainly like the reactions on alkenes. It was still Markovnikov because we were producing the more substituted carbocation. We saw a lot of reactions with alkenes where we used sulfuric acid. The mercury here is a catalyst, but we didn't say what would happen. The big thing, though, is watch out for these enols. If we produce an enol, that's going to tautomerize to produce a ketone or an aldehyde.